OK, well, it's time to welcome our next guest who's going between the lines at Wimbledon. She's been lucky enough to spend the day not only on Centre Court, but here in the Evian Suite Very as well. Very lucky indeed. Sophie, tell us about your day. How has it been? Who have you seen? Tell us everything. So this is the first time I've ever been to, to well, to Centre Court and to Wimbledon at all. So it's been amazing. The weather's been perfect. It's been a right treat. And I saw Kyrgios play, which was extraordinary. <gasps> yeah. First the bad, time. How the was he? Yeah, I hear mm. this. He's a bad boy attack. I didn't know that. I didn't know. He seemed really nice. He Is seemed he like right. a good boy out there? I don't know. Yeah, I think so. Oh, okay. good, yeah, good. Yeah, no kind good. of moments where you're like, <gasps> No, no, no. I was loving it. It was so much fun. And yes. also the disabled seating where we were, which is like just, it seems to be the best seats in the house. There was a little boy next to us who was so excited. So we're just getting really involved and cheering and having fun. So it was great. Now, your CV is absolutely ridiculous. You're a TV presenter. You've... Uh, fronted three Paralympic Games. You've hosted series for the BBC and Channel 4. You've appeared on Loose Women, perhaps the greatest accolade of them all. <laughs> uh, you're also a writer and an artist, and you're an award-winning disability advocate. Uh. Sophie Morgan, your LinkedIn page must be <laughs> so long to scroll. It's ridiculous. Um, how would you describe what you do? Is there any one thing, or are you, are you, uh, do you love the fact that you have so many sort of multi-potentialite ventures <laughs> that you go down? I like, it's a great question. I think I like... All of it. But the disability advocate one, I suppose I'm most proud of. But it wasn't an intentional choice. That kind of came around because the disability movement needs as many voices in it as possible. So the more I got the chance to speak or got a platform to speak, I used it. And so that kind of came around accidentally, but I'm very proud to do it. But I'd say my favourite thing is probably presenting on a travel show. You work a lot in sport as well, don't you? What is it that you love about presenting in that world? So I started on the... Paralympic Games in 2012 and I was a really small part of that presenting team and that was really exciting because it was the first time ever that we'd seen disabled talent on uh, really being put, put forward to present so that was a real privilege but then when I got more involved in the 2016 Games and I was I was one of the lead anchors that was so much fun because it was just great to be part of the paras in themselves, but to see how the sport had evolved, because the sport, Paralympic sport's been obviously been around forever, but it hadn't, it, after 2012, it really shifted. And so the quality of the sport got better and the quality of the broadcasting got better and everything got better and better and more exciting and also being in Rio. And to watch, which is the one that sucked you in? Mm. Which sport? Yeah. Good question. Ah, oh, I'd say, do you know what, actually, the tennis. Good uh, answer. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah and, and not a prompted answer. I would definitely say it was the tennis. Because uh, I, I used to play tennis when I was a kid, and I loved it. And then when I had my accident and I went to learn again, I found it the hardest sport to play. Have you ever tried wheelchair tennis? Never. Do no. you need to have, obviously, the skills any tennis player would have? It's the moving of the chair whilst yes. pushing the, the, with your tennis racket in your hand and then timing it perfectly. If you don't time, obviously, this, it seems really obvious thing to say, but if you don't time it perfectly and your chair's moving just too quickly and then you can't get the, it's just, I found it so hard that I just went, no, it's not for me, I can't do it. Right, I can't yeah. do it. So I loved watching it. And obviously we've got such great British players, amazing players, some of the best in the world. Like you say that there is so much, because it's not just about concentrating on, you know, the ball and the racket. You're having to control the chair, yeah. put yourself in the right and place. And also you're much lower. So yeah. I, again, it sounds obvious, but the thought of playing tennis when you're sitting down, you know, the, the net and everything, it's just the seeing. I, I found it really hard to get to gauge the distance and all of that. The skill involved is extraordinary. Yeah, you probably can't see the other person's eyes even. Do it's going to be mean? masked out by that. The serving, I thought, was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You're basically serving at net height. Yeah. yeah, right? It's extraordinary. And it's all, that's the thing about para sport, I'd say. Again, to your question about what I enjoy about para sport is seeing all these sports that have been adapted is really interesting and, and trying to get people who are who haven't had experience of them because I, I wasn't a Paralympian myself I got into the, the the broadcasting just because I was pursuing a career in broadcasting so to learn about the sports and how they've been adapted and how challenging they are and then to try and communicate that to a non-disabled audience is really it's fun in itself just to get people to see differently like the, how the sport has changed and how hard it is and how fun it is and, and then get people really into it because it's just sport at the end of the day. It doesn't matter how it's played. It's yeah. still engaging to watch. Yeah, it really mm. is. Yeah. Can I ask you about what happened to you when you were 18? Yeah, sure, of course. I, so when I was 18, I was leaving school and I had finished school in the June time and then I'd had a couple of months of, of just having fun. That 
amazing feeling that I'm sure we can all probably slightly remember, you know, when you leave school and yeah. you're just about to step out into adult life and you're off on an adventure. And I had had a couple of months of that and then I came back to get my A-level results, which is in the August. And that night that I got the A-level results, I was driving home from the party where I collected my results and I was sober and, and seat belted and all of that, but I lost control of the car I was driving and, and uh, broke my back. So I was paralysed instantly from the chest down and was taken to hospital in Scotland, then flown down to London to rehabilitate for three months. And then, yeah, gone, for, gone on from there. So I kind of came out of hospital, a full-time wheelchair user and um, a paraplegic. And yeah, I've just sort of gone, forged a quite ex sort of unusual life since then, really, kind of figuring out where I was going to go and what I was going to do. I wasn't very sure at the time. I was intending... When I was at school, I was intending to study law, which was a really extraordinary idea, looking back on it, but it was what it was. And then I had my accident and turned around and said I want to study art because I loved that. So I went and shifted direction in life and followed my passion. But then that led on to some extraordinary opportunities. So I did a couple of BBC documentaries where I was a contributor. And then that kind of led into telly. So I sort of, again, found myself on a different path unexpectedly and... Yeah, that's where, how I've got to where I am today, really. It's amazing that you've been able to take all of these challenges and actually mm -hmm. some of the opportunities that come up with them in your stride and how you've done them. It's, uh, it's, it shows a sort of incredible strength of mind. Was it the decision to study art? Was there something else that allowed you some focus in what I can only imagine would have been an incredibly difficult and dark time? I think looking back on it, I couldn't say there was one thing specifically. I think... There was a combination of, of drivers, really. One was this determination to get my life back because I very nearly died in the crash and I was so close to being an adult. And I, as I said earlier, had only tasted a couple of months worth of freedom, so to mm. speak, having just left school. And I was like, I want it more, I want more. So I was really determined to get that back and get my independence back, however that looked. I think then I also got very motivated by some of the, the perceptions that I started to encounter when I left hospital and the sort of discriminations that kept, that kept happening. Sort of people saying you can't do this or you can't go there or literally physical barriers stopping me from being able to live my life. And that, that was a bit of a like, right, I need to find a way to, to change this. Uh, and again, that goes back to what I was saying about the sort of accidental ac activist or accidental advocate that I've become because there was just so much that needed to be changed. And so I got quite motivated by that. I also think I had the best friends and family around me, so I had all of that to, um, to help push me forward when I didn't think I could do it anymore. Mm -hmm. But I'd also say, people say that about my story, they're like, oh, it's a, you've got so much resilience or you've got so much uh, strength or whatever. But I would say most people would be surprised by how much they can withstand until they have to do it themselves. And, I, I, you know, if, you, if the shoes was on the other foot, so, so to speak, I would probably say, how did you do that? Because you just don't know what you're capable of until you're put into that situation. And I think as an 18-year-old girl, I had no idea that I would be able to do what I did. But you do, you just, you find a way. So, yeah, I don't think it was one thing. And, that, and those motivations change all the time as well. So today, you know, my mission is one thing, which was, it wasn't when I was younger. So it just keeps evolving. What is your mission at the moment? No. <laughs> uh, a number of things. I think it's very much to shift perceptions around disability. I think I've got a strong agenda to, to try, I think there's a, there's a number of things, increase the visibility of disability, whether that be myself or others. And I use obviously TV to do that, as yeah. that's one way of doing it. I think to encourage and empower more disabled leadership we don't see enough of, of that and, and really at the heart of it is this sort of accurate representation of disability and actually today is the start of or yesterday was the start of disability pride month and so there's a lot of talk at the moment about what does disability pride mean and and for me that's part of the work I do it's all about sort of reclaiming this identity of being very proud to be different, being very proud to be disabled and not seeing that word as a dirty word, mm -hmm. seeing that as a, as a label to be proud of. So that's very much a, a mission of mine as well. And then all of the stuff about disability just goes to one side and it's about just living a really fun, happy, fulfilled, purposeful life. So yeah, 
quite a lot. Yeah, a lot, a lot going on. And it, but it feels like you're making sort of massive inroads in what you've just described there. I remember when the 2012 Olympics and then the Paralympics were on, I think it was the first time that I was really aware of Paralympic sport. And I think people were craving that feeling of, oh, it's London, it's yeah. the Olympic Games continuing. Yeah. And people were delighted that Channel 4 were running loads more amazing sport from a place that, you, you know, for a lot of people, you could look out the window and see. Yeah. And it felt like that was the real start of people not necessarily thinking it, of it as something that's not for them, yeah. but thinking of it as something for absolutely everyone. Do you feel, did you feel that shift at that time in terms of, uh, you know, people not really thinking about it to then suddenly it's all anyone can talk about? Yeah, completely. Well, firstly, as a Londoner, I was like, what is going on? The city changed, it felt, completely. So, you know, tubes became accessible and, and it seemed like also people, the, the, the general public seemed really responsive to disability in a way I'd never seen before. So instead of little kids sort of staring and pointing, they were like, hi, who are you? Thinking, you know, I was a Paralympian or something. It was a really engaging and fun. That was a massive shift. Obviously, the broadcasting was unprecedented. No one had seen anything like it. And the way that Channel 4 took the games and shifted the way that it was, you know, that we saw disability sport. No one had ever done that, ever, in the world. So that was huge. And I think for disabled people anywhere, it was a moment. It was a real moment. And you thought it, was, it felt tangible on the streets, like I said, but also just there was the, the, the rhetoric in the newspapers and the stuff that was coming out around disability. It was the first time I'd ever seen anything like it. You know, just from the stories that we would see on the news and instead of it being about the pitiful disabled person it was about the inspiring superhuman that was the, the, the word that was being used the, the superhumans are here and you remember that fabulous advert which was thanks for the warm-up to the yeah. olympics yeah, so right? good so Just good like, brilliant 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 and like, yeah, it was. It was a huge moment. And I, I, we just hoped, all of us, that it would turn into this movement and not just be a moment. And that's yet to be seen. But it was, it was extraordinary. How was Tokyo last summer? It was, it, was, it was amazing. It was quite a weird experience, though, because Tokyo was in a state of lockdown. So we were very much not able to, you know, there was obviously no spectators, as we all yeah. know, but as uh, us lot were out there filming it, we couldn't do anything without being watched. I think for an athlete, that must affect things so massively. Yeah. You look at Wimbledon there, you were on Centre Court the other day, you've been on it today, yeah. I'm getting to go on it uh, tomorrow, mm. and it would feel... Not, not anticlimactic. Anti yeah. 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 I, I think, I think you, they are, you, they're so clearly... Uh, performance yeah. and they are feeding off the reactions of the crowd and you can yeah. see like either getting a boo or getting a cheer you can see that it's like actual rocket fuel yeah. that does something in their brains oh, it must it must exactly especially if you've been waiting for four years mm. yeah. for that moment which obviously so many of them had and also the other thing that's interesting with the olympic cycles and the paralympic cycles is that you get young athletes coming in at a time when they've never been seen before because they've been they might have been on the circuit so to speak for th four years but they haven't been seen in an international stage so they're coming out for the first time and ex expecting this extraordinary experience and then there's no one there yeah. you know it's a bit it's of a, you know, yeah. yeah it's just us yeah. like Hi. Yeah. <laughs> 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 So Sophie, how has the Evian suite been for you today? I mean, it's fab in here, isn't it? So nice. Yeah. I feel proper VIP. Yeah. I mean, honestly, this is <laughs> the first time I've been to Wimbledon and then to come in here as well. It's just like, yes, this is lovely. Great food. Obviously, lots of water. Yes, which staying is important hydrated. It's hot out there. Yeah. yeah. No, it's been really lovely. I've been treated really well. Obviously, the partnership between Wimbledon and Evian is a special one. You'll have experienced that today. Uh, they've collaborated again for this year's Wimbledon Championships that have become a, an iconic moment of yeah. summer. And we've been thinking a lot about iconic moments over the last few weeks. And, and if you were to isolate one moment of your career, they're like, yes, that was iconic for me. What does that bring up for you when you think about it? So the day I arrived in Rio in 2016, and we broadcast live to what was apparently like, I can't even tell you how many millions of people. We didn't want to know. Yeah. It's the first time I'd ever done live broadcasting. Really? Oh, ever. Oh, oh my goodness. goodness. The oh, amount you know, of people that would have been watching. It's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd never done a live, a live TV. I had no really, I, I mean, I just learned about the Paralympics themselves, which are very complicated. 
and I was sitting on the in the hot seat with my co-presenter and they went you know we're live and I remember <laughs> we did the first bit and it felt so monumental and we introduced the games and everything kicked off and it was it was so wonderful to be there and obviously it was Rio so it was carnival atmosphere and then I remember it, we went to a break a really really badly we timed it really badly and this we went, I went on Twitter and somebody messaged saying I think these two are out of their depth oh I know, no. I know. And we were like yes we are oh. we are we're out of our depth there's that always was somebody there that wants to say but something you know like what? that it was true it was true because we were so nervous we were so the pressure was so huge and it was such amazing we knew it was the beginning of our for the I mean my co-presenter we knew it was the beginning of our of our, of our careers, it was yeah. the start of something. So we were like, the pressure, the pressure, plus don't mess it up, it's the Paralympics. So, that, so I'd say that was, for me, a really massive moment. So here on our podcast, we have been asking our guests to write down something that means a lot to them, whether it's something just fun and upbeat or whether it's something that is a quote that really lives with them so that we can then sort of recycle it a bit like we do with the Evian bottles and pass it on to our next guest. I feel like you've got so much wisdom and like I could just chat to you for so long would you be all right to write a quote for us of course I can well of before can. we before we get your quote maybe good for point. inspiration we have another inspirational quote which was left by our last guest so Izzy Bizu so she's a singer and a songwriter and she I'll be honest she's in a very neat paper folder as well yes. that's the neatest anyone's yeah. done it uh, so uh, she's popped the message inside our Evian bottle which I do will I take get it to out. read it? You yes, do get to read it. We don't know what this says. Oh, right. And we also can't vouch for her handwriting. Uh, yes. <laughs> Only you. seek validation from yourself. That's it's quite good. a hard one to follow. It's a hard one to follow, but a good one to be reminded one, of. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Right, so shall I write one in? Yes. Now, what I can tell you, I'm not looking closely here. Uh, but I can see it's a lovely long message here. Well, she could be a slow writer. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I don't know if anyone could read my handwriting. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to fold it up. Yeah? yeah. Perfect. Oh, then... you're being very good with that fold because I commented on how good That's it is. That's it. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. So if you up. wouldn't mind popping it there in the bottle. Pleasure. Now, obviously, we're here. You're here. Sue Barker, I think, is here. And we've heard that you have an excellent Sue Barker story. Yeah, I uh, honestly, I'll never forget it. I got a phone call out of the blue one afternoon and it was Sue Barker. <gasps> no! Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't believe it at first. Like, what, who? Yeah. And it was, it's Sue Parker. And she, yeah, she told me all the things that I needed to do to make sure I could combat my nerves. Obviously, it didn't really work that well. But she gave me, yeah, just uh, her time. It was so lovely, so generous. She was amazing. And um, she just wished me the best of luck. And then I, and I remember, because I was, I was sitting on holiday, and I was actually in a swimming pool at the time, because I hadn't, I just thought it was, a, I didn't, so I was just floating, going, I'm speaking to Sue Parker. <laughs> I'm speaking to Sue Parker for about half an oh hour. And I was like, thank you very much. Oh, it was, a, yeah, it was lovely. When you put the phone down, were you like, um, uh, everybody, uh, uh, that was so Yeah, dark literally. <laughs> and it was a what? No. <laughs> I was like, this is Seriously, yeah, it's so lovely. I she was so nice. I could love Sue Barker any more I than know. I do. I know. I mean, every stories. time I see her on, on telly now, I think she's just a pro. She's I brilliant. Know. Can you oh, share with us legend. like one of the tips say, and tricks that, come on, that please, stuck with uh, you? I don't want to. I don't want you to know, rip off Sue's shtick now. here. <laughs> she said, you, "You can't make a mistake because one of the things a, a new presenter will do is when they make a mistake." they panic, you know, they're kind of, oh, um, so sorry, or, you know, on live TV, you, you'll stumble or you'll stutter or you'll, you know, you'll make it obvious. And she said, you can't make a mistake, it's how you recover, so just let it go. So she's, and when she said that, I started noticing how, when mistakes are made, that when they're made by the pros, you don't know. You just don't know. Yeah. You know, they'll start to say someone's name wrong, but instead of falling apart and just going, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed, they go, oh no, and they just repeat the name. Yeah, now they're so smooth, so aren't they? Smooth. Yes. So smooth. They make it look effortless. And they say they make it look like they know exactly what they're doing, even when they don't. Yes. So yeah, so that was another bit. Sophie, we have loved chatting with you, but we want to get to know you a little bit more, if that's okay. So in honor of Centre Court turning 100 yesterday, we've put 100 seconds on the clock, and we're going to throw you some quick fire questions. Now, don't overthink it. Just say the first thing that comes into your mind. Are you ready for this? Yes. Yeah. OK. OK, I will kick things off in three, two, Two, one, mountains or beach? Mountains. Henman Hill or Murray Mound? Murray Mound. Doubles or singles? Singles. Still or sparkling Avian? Sparkling. What's your middle name? Don't have one. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm intrigued. Yeah. Uh, what time do you go to bed? Oh, too late. What advice would you give to your younger self? Make mistakes. 
Oh, no such thing as a big mistake. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Would you like to travel way into the future or way into the past? Ooh, ooh, past. Which tennis player would you most like to meet? Nadal. What is your most used emoji? Um, awkward face. Mm. Yeah. One way you're trying to reduce your carbon footprint. Oh, not having children. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? That's really tough. That's, That's tough. tough. And you're doing a travel show, so you should know better than most. Everywhere, ever, anywhere, everywhere. In a van. City or countryside? Countryside. If you weren't a broadcaster, what would you like to do? Paint. Favourite place to go on holiday? Somewhere new. Uh, outdoor picnic or posh afternoon tea? Outdoor picnic. Do you have a nickname? Mog. I think that is the 100 seconds. Hey. Sophie, thank you so much for your time. Thank we have you loved me. chatting with you today. Thank you. And uh, do you know what? We won't keep you anymore because I know that Nadal's on, isn't he? And yes. you're racing back to see him. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.